I'm Dr. Laura Gifford. The results that we have gotten in this place clinically have been astounding. We need to eat food that's real. Ditch the sugars and the grain. Fat doesn't make you fat. Fat does not cause heart disease. You literally are what you eat. Let's talk about insulin and where it comes from and what happens um, in, in the body. I'm Dr. Jillian Murphy. This is definitely not what I was taught in school. This is what I thought that food should be able to do for people. There's that old adage, you are what you eat, but you really actually are what you digest. The ultimate health combination is vegetables, plus protein, plus healthy fat. Cholesterol gets such a bad rap. All of our sex hormones come from cholesterol. Healthy poop versus not so healthy poop. Any questions about that? I'm Michelle McKelpin. 80% of our body composition is based on what you eat. Move frequently at a slow pace. Lift heavy things. Resistance training. It's not too late. You can put muscle mass on at any age. You really don't need weights or machines. Posture is really, really important. If it comes from a factory and has and has an ingredients list, it's not, it's not whole food, it's not the way nature intended it. And you'd be amazed, we, we are abundant the amount of food we actually have that comes from the earth or roams the earth. That's really what we're designed to eat. Tonight's lecture is exercise like a cave woman. Um, I think it's a fun one. We're going to get up and move a little bit at the end, which is nice. Um, it's not quite as much science-y stuff as last week, so we just kind of go over um, basically the primal blueprint fitness which so far I think all you guys have touched on is eating um, and things like that. So there are some words like insulin and stuff like that, but it's not quite as science as before. So it's kind of a nice change. So last week or sorry, the week before, you probably went through a chart that looks just similar to this, but it was all about food and what we should and should not be eating. So this is the one, if you haven't seen it before, about exercise that Mark Sisson, uh, I should have just put a picture of Mark Sisson up. Have you guys seen him yet? He's not hard to look at. Um, <laughs> so this is what we're going to go through tonight in some detail. Like I said, we're not going to go too sciencey, but just kind of change how you hopefully think of exercise. So that sort of mountain that Laura was talking about, we're hopefully going to break that down and realize that it's not quite as scary as a lot of the time you think exercise is. Okay, so um, the first thing we're gonna look at is this bottom one here. So usually as pyramids go, this is what we wanna do the most often. So move frequently at a slow pace. So um, we'll get into a little more here. Okay, so one thing before we get too started is we have to remember that 80% of our body composition is based on what we eat, which is actually good for us because we're all ahead of the game. So by making this lifestyle change that we have with our diet, uh, we've already done this 80%, but I just wanted to add this because I see a lot of people go through my gym that exercise and exercise and exercise, but you can't take back the crap that you eat. So uh, just keep in mind that about 20% is determined by the lifestyle choices you make um, and the food you eat and a little bit of genetics, but um, most of it is what we eat. So this is important, but not quite as important um, as what we eat. Okay, so um, this is just overall that kind of pyramid. So the point that Mark Sisson, why he made this sort of exercise um, pyramid and that he, what he wants us to follow is so hopefully uh, you will build and maintain lean muscle mass, reduce body fat, which is what we're going for, increase energy, improve strength, agility, and power, improve insulin sensitivity, boost immune function, and increase organ reserve, which we'll touch on a little more. So all those same things sound pretty good, don't they? All right, some other things that are great about the Primal Fitness is it is right for everyone. And I can't stress this enough. So if you did leave the foundations or if you haven't had it yet, if you do leave it feeling a bit overwhelmed, especially probably with kettlebell swings, <laughs> those took me forever to learn. Um, this whole point of the Primal Fitness, which is also how we run our classes as well, is that it's adaptable for anyone. So it doesn't matter how old you are. My absolute favorite thing is when I have someone in my class who's like uh, 70, I have a lady who's 70, and then there's like a 17-year-old working out beside her. I love when she's doing more weight than 17-year-old, but I just like when I, you can see that crazy amount of age difference and you wouldn't even know. Um, so. This whole fitness that I'm going to talk about tonight, it doesn't matter your fitness level. If you haven't exercised in years, if you've never exercised, it really is right for everyone, which is nice, and hopefully you'll get that. 
as I continue on. It also helps avoid injury, so as you'll see, there's lots of rest. There's as much rest as you want. You can just rest the whole time, um, which helps to avoid any overuse injuries and overstressing your body, which is a big problem with exercise. The other thing I find is it isn't boring. So maybe you've learned in the foundations already. It's, um, it's nice, not that we didn't put you on a treadmill facing a wall for an hour, right? It's different stuff that you haven't done before. And uh, yeah, it's just nice to switch it up. I'm a bit biased because I don't like treadmills and ellipticals and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I just, I get bored very easily. I literally would probably fall off the treadmill because I would be looking around and just shoot off the back. Um, so I, have to, I always have to be doing different things. So I really like this exercise for that reason. And hopefully you guys have caught on to that. Um, it, yeah, so you don't have to get a gym membership. Obviously, we hope you join our classes, which is, I guess, kind of like a gym membership. But as you will see, all you need is your body and a little piece of space for most of these this type of exercise. So um, you don't need, if you can't afford it or don't want to, you do not need to buy any gym membership for anything I'm talking about tonight. So prepares you for challenges. This is a little bit of the primal. So if you think of that cave woman that we're all trying to be, um, we need to be strong in case a lion, I don't know, whatever would be coming to attack you. So obviously in real life, we're just slips, falls, um, things like that we need to be strong enough to deal with. And it's training to live. So unfortunately, the best part of your life doesn't happen in my gym, even though I really wish it did. Um, so we're just really trying to be healthy and be fit to live our life, right? It's not, we're not trying to win any fitness competitions. We're just trying to be strong and healthy enough to, to do what we love outside of fitness. Okay, so like I said, uh, so we'll start with this bottom one. So move frequently at a slow pace. So um, kind of the key things about this is it plays a major role in weight balance or weight loss, actually. Um, we'll go into a little bit more, but it really does. And move frequently and slow pace is literally slow, like super, super slow. And it is the hardest thing that you will find of this whole exercise program is finding the time to move slow. Um, so it strengthens the cardiovascular and immune system, which um, fast-paced exercise actually uh, hurts the immune system. It promotes efficient fat metabolism, so that's why the uh, weight loss is so great with moving slowly. It gives you a strong base to handle more intense workouts, so it's um, basically toning your joints, connective tissues, muscles, so that when you do do harder workouts, uh, your body's ready for it. And it physiologically and hormonally counters the effect of stress. So I just want to talk for a second about um, what we call around here chronic cardio. So is anyone a runner, like likes to run for long periods of time? So this is, no, not at all. <laughs> um, so this is a little bit different. If you, so this is talking about why um, if, you're do, if you think that you have to run for an hour, an hour and a half a day to be fit or healthy or lose weight, this is why um, I'm going to go in detail of why you don't have to do that. If you just love to run and it's the reason it helps with um, removing stress and it makes you feel happy and kind of is your alone time then don't worry quite as much. So this chronic cardio is when you think of going to the gym for an hour and a half on the elliptical and like watching that little calorie thing and just giving her until that number pops that you want to see or um, running outside, any of that sort of mid to high level, so you're out of breath, you probably can't keep up a conversation, and you're doing it for an extended amount of time. So we call it, well, Mark Sisson calls it chronic cardio because it's usually also performed every day. So I'm sure some you all have that runner friend that their day isn't complete until they run, and if they don't fit it in, and by the time their day is done, they run late at night. It's that sort of... Um, Session. Yes. It, yes, exactly. Okay, so, and a lot of times, unfortunately, that's what we think that we need to do. So if you do have that friend, they may happen to be uh, a peer fit, and you think, I am going to have to spend an hour and a half of my day running to be able to be fit. So this is just why I'm here, is just to say that that's not, uh, it's not actually healthy for you or the healthiest thing you can do, and it's not um, right. So it requires a large amount of dietary carbohydrates. Uh, it, which therefore promotes the overproduction of insulin. And we know from last week, insulin we do not want, right? We do not want an overproduction of insulin. Um, 
So it stops the use of fat as an energy source. So usually the main reason why people exercise is to burn fat. This type of chronic cardio will actually stop burning fat. So yeah, that's <laughs> kind of a circle there that you don't want to be stuck in. Um, so it decreases efficient fat metabolism, so it's mostly burning glucose and glycogen stores, so the carbohydrates you eat instead of the fat that is stored, and burns relatively little body fat. So it promotes overeating to compensate for lost glycogen. So I call it the hamster wheel. So you exercise and you work out hard for an hour or an hour and a half, whatever it may be. You burn all of these glycogen stores, you use all of your glucose, you get home from the gym and you're hungry. So I didn't even remember that when you're just, you've worked out and you're so hungry and it's not broccoli that you crave. It's the, pasta. yes, <laughs> pasta. And it's um, pasta or sweets or um, there's this big thing going on right now about chocolate milk. Have you seen those ads mm -hmm. that chocolate people should be, um, chocolate milk has a lot of sugar in it. I'm not, I, do you guys, did you learn? I don't quite know where this chocolate milk is. It's because there's protein and sugar in it. So it's like you get your post-exercise protein and your sugar, but it's not like in popular culture that is that appears to be the right yeah, idea. It's not. So yeah. anyways, so you get home from the store, you've worked out, you've worked out hard, you get home, you're starving, you eat something that's probably not ideal, then you go to bed and you feel guilty about what you ate and you wake up and you do it again. That's that's what I call the hamster wheel, is this kind of keep circle of yes you go to the gym which is great, but then you eat something you're not supposed to usually and then do it again. So tonight if I refer to the hamster wheel, it's that unfortunate cycle that many people are on. Um, so working out in this high level aerobic activity also increases cortisol, which um, Dr. Murphy will talk about more when you have the stress and sleep lecture. It's an amazing lecture and it talks all about why we do not want high levels of cortisol in our body and unfortunately why a lot of us do. But basically um, it tell is telling your body to store fat and not burn it. So again, you're exercising, which is great, but you're also, without knowing, telling your body to store fat. So that's not ideal. Um, increases systemic inflammation. I'm, I'm sure you touched a little bit on it last week too with the insulin that we don't want our bodies to be constantly inflamed. Um, and that can be controlled by what we eat as, in addition to how we exercise. So it's known as the silent killer. It's look at all that it's connected to. So fat gain, heart disease, insulin resistance, diabetes, asthma, arthritis cancer, stomach problems, and more. And there literally was more. I was sick of typing. <laughs> I was like, it's a lot. Um, and again, that's coming from that high-level aerobic exercise. It also increases oxidative damage, so free radical production, which um, is associated with aging. Okay, so why move slowly? So here we're, supposed to, we're talking about that low-level um, activity that slow hiking, um, brisk walking. So it reduces the risk of metabolic syndrome, which unfortunately a lot of people um, are at risk of. It also breast cancer, death and cardiovascular disease. It decreases overall inflammation. As I just said, that high level aerobic increases it, this decreases it, and the large um, disease risk that I also just again didn't want to type out for you. Uh, decreases body fat, can lower blood pressure, and lots of mental health benefits. There's great research right now on um, slow movement exercise and what it does for uh, mental health. So with people with chronic depression, it can elevate their mood for two hours or more in 20 minutes or less of slow movement, which is great for, um, for anyone, let alone someone who's suffering from chronic depression. It's great. It also lowers the risk of dementia, just that like slow moving walking. As, as much as you can. It's also fun and social. Yes, I said fun. So like I said, this slow moving is like walking, walking your dog, meeting friends and going for a hike. Um, in the winter, which it still is apparently, cross country <laughs> skiing, um, snowshoeing, any of those sort of, your heart rate is up, but you're not out of breath. So I, there are numbers, as it says here, 50 to 60% of your max heart rate. We can tell you how to calculate your max heart rate, but basically can you talk is a really good um, judge of it. So if you can keep up a conversation with your friends that you're exercising with, you're probably on the right track. So um, 
Yes, and it also doesn't mean, so you are already going to, on the elliptical for an hour and a half, so now that you've heard my lecture, now you do it slowly for an hour and a half. <laughs> Get outside. Um, it's great because when we do this lecture in the fall, everyone's like, but winter's coming soon. But at least we know that nice weather is on its way. And so use the summertime to get outside and, uh, and walk. I was just dog sitting and I um, don't move slowly as much as I should. And it was the best thing ever. We had a dog for a month and it was kind of a bigger dog, lots of exercise and the amount of walks I went on. It's, now that we gave her back, I can't believe how much I miss it. And I actually do see those mental health benefits. Of, um, I know it's hard to find the time, but a nice half an hour walk outside can do wonders for other things going on in your, in your life. Walking fast is still moving slowly in the sense that you're, if you're not on a full jog. Um, but this is talking about like taking an hour of your Sunday and like going for a hike or a walk around your community or whatever it may be. So it's, it is, like I said, it's the hardest part is finding the time. If you're not like... Um, it's like just speed walking in the Olympics. <laughs> if you're not doing that type of, like you wouldn't be able to talk, you probably, it, this would fall under that. Very fit people could go for a really light jog and it'd still be in this sort of 50 to 60%, but I just didn't want to get too technical with that. But it's just, I'm just trying to get away from that thinking that we have to be on the treadmill at level 10 uh, for an hour to see benefits, because mm -hmm. it's actually doing worse for your body and moving slowly is, is doing more. Are there any other, and so like I kind of alluded to, it doesn't have to be walking. So um, if you love swimming, which is uh, great in many ways, uh, it can be through swimming, skating, when it would have been more in the winter, um, cross country skiing, rowing, um, yeah, biking is a really good one as well. So for this primal lifestyle, we try to accumulate three to five hours a week, and that doesn't have to be in a row, obviously. So if you can walk to work for half an hour there and back, that's you already have an hour of your day. Um, and obviously like 15 minutes or 20 minute intervals still add up too. Are there any questions about that? Good. I just wanted to comment actually on um, the benefit of doing movement like this. Um, I'm really, well, I won't get into that, but anyways. Um, your brain is a muscle just like every other part of your body and it's always got to practice what it does if it's not going to get weak, so to speak. And so movement like this is really, really low risk and it's really, really, really good for your brain. Because every time you lift your arm or move your foot or anything like that, your brain has to send a message all the way through your whole body and get it all the way down to the tips of your toes to move. And so the more you do that, the better you get at it. And then when you go to avoid falling over something or to jump over something, you're going to be better at it because you've done all this slow movement. Point. Okay, and um, on the pyramid, he doesn't specifically mention play, but play is an enormous part of this. So playing with your kids, playing with your grandkids, playing out in the yard with your dog, throwing a frisbee, that's still part of this slow movement um, stuff. So getting out, um, so playing a sport is a great example. Um, I put this picture on because he posted an article or a blog post a little while back about how he was um, paddleboarding. Where can I, yeah, paddleboarding, and this whole herd of or school of dolphins came up beside him, which is crazy and not going to happen here. But it's just show that he trains so that he can paddleboard, and then that's when the great life experiences happen, not when he's in the gym working out, right? Um, so we want to be able to play and maintain this for throughout our whole life. Um, okay, so we're done with the bottom one. Everyone's got that. You're going to try to find the time to walk a little bit more or cycle, whatever works for you. So the next one is the lift heavy thing. So this is a little bit more of the actual um, workout type things. So for example, what you did in the foundations class, that would be the lift heavy things. Um, and it doesn't have to be weights either, so I'm going to go into this, but lift heavy things can be yourself, not calling you heavy, but um, it's just resistance training, basically. So, it is brief, intense sessions of full body functional movements, um, one to three times per week, and it's ranging anywhere between 70 to 60 minutes. And so it's quite often called HIT training, so high intensity interval training. And don't take my word for what I'm going to tell you tonight. Look it up. There is so much information on why HIT training 
is so phenomenal. Especially the number one things that's going to pop up if you Google search it is that it's uh, a lot more efficient, a lot better way to get rid of belly fat, or sorry, quicker way than it is for aerobic training. So that those long runs. It's a high intensity interval training if I said that too quickly. Okay, so why we want to do this type of exercise. So it stimulates lean muscle development, so gain muscle. It improves organ reserve, which I said I'll talk about a little bit more in detail. Accelerates fat loss, which is usually why we're going to the gym, to either gain muscle or lose fat, or hopefully both. Um, and the more lean mass you have, means a better life. So I'll go on about that. Okay, so I just, I knew there was a lot of women in the group, and I just wanted to make, a lot of times, women are very scared, just to generalize, and I shouldn't do that, but scared about gaining muscle. So I hear it all of the time through my job, um, and through my schooling, that of women that say, I just they come in and they want to tone up. That's great. Um, usually tone up means lose a little weight, gain a little muscle, but it's that fear of bulking up that we kind of need to throw out the window, unfortunately. Um, most of the time, women don't bulk up anywhere near as much as men do because of the less the le less testosterone we have, um, and mus gaining muscle is so important for women. Um, so just try not to have that fear when you're doing the classes of doing heavier weights because we do need to gain muscle um, just as much as men do. So a low muscle mass is associated with accelerated aging, health problems, so diabetes, heart disease, osteoporosis, and many more. Um, so greater risk of breaking a bone a little bit with osteoporosis, but we need that impact of strength training, whether it be with weights or your own body, to build strong bones. Um, and unfortunately, osteoporosis or osteopenia is becoming much more uh, rel um, prevalent. prevalent. Thank you. Um, I seem to know a lot of family members or family friends that are getting it, which is really unfortunate. Poor posture, so if you think about it, we're gonna talk more on posture, but everyone's learned their new fancy posture. Um, we really need to have, you maybe have felt it if you've been really honestly giving posture a go, but we need to have muscle mass through our midsection to hold us up, right? So um, they probably said with when they were telling you posture, but no one wants to end up like the little old lady with the you know, bad posture and really rounded um, neck, but that comes from not physically being able to hold ourselves up into good posture. So we do need to maintain muscle mass as we age to be able to stand nice and tall. Has anyone felt that yet in posture? Their legs, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, their muscles start to be tired just from holding themselves up. Low muscle mass is associated with getting regular colds, low mood, and uh, being depressed. So why we should gain muscle. So less, it's basically the opposite of what I just said. So less uh, body fat will look better, less risk of many diseases, better posture, like I said, we need strong lower back and core. We also are uh, to avoid back pain. So I'm not sure if anyone kind of heard through the challenge because there are patients here. Um, but I obviously, because working at a chiropractic clinic, hear a ton of low back pain stories. The stronger the back you have in good posture, might I add, the better off you're going to be for preventing low back pain in the future. Um, in addition, the better posture you have, the least chance you have of that one time picking something up wrong and throwing your back out. But we need to get muscle through our lower back um, and upper back to avoid back pain as much as we can. It also increases better balance and flexibility. Uh, I think it more correlates. So if you're doing resistance training, you're probably more on your feet with weights and um, offsetting yourself and you're warming up and cooling down. So those are kind of more correlated than one causes the other, but um, either way, we all need, how's everyone's balance? Was it shocking in the FMS, your balance, or did everyone do pretty well? I guess I should ask the, the judges. <laughs> yeah, how are their balance? Everyone in general. In one, it was hard, but it's good. I think when I told people to close their eyes and stand on one foot, they thought it was going to be easier than it was. Yeah. Most it's people hard. thought it was going to be easier. You never asked me to do that. <laughs> I close my. That thing with your leg over the string. Perfect. Oh yeah. yeah. That was that impossible. Was, that looks so easy, but it's not. <laughs> it's really hard for us because we have to show it, right? Kind of, to give an idea. So we have to like master that FMS before we can 
teach it. So I don't know if they did it for you guys, but I try to show the like same leg, arm and leg going out. But it's really embarrassing when I'm like falling all over the place and I'm like, you should probably can do it better than I can. <laughs> but, uh, so better mental outlook, uh, stronger immune system, and you'll age better. It's not, that's what this slide's about. So okay, does anyone know what I mean when I say organ reserve? Have you guys heard that before? Have you ever heard, uh, well, I'm sure you have. Sorry, I'm just going to get a glass more. Of oh, someone passing away due to natural causes, or like passing away in their sleep. Mm -hmm. That's sort of like nothing's really wrong. Um, it's actually a quite lovely way to go, I can imagine. Old? But yeah, like just yeah. of old age. Or, yeah. yeah. Um, that's sort of what I relate to organ reserve. So basically it's our uh, body's capacity, for the capacity of our organs to support life. So for our body to sort of keep on going um, without not a certain illness or a trauma. So it's just in general how long our body can kind of support life. Um, so when we're young, we can handle things like the common cold or the flu we seem to always get every couple of months um, or an injury because our body, we're young and we have this organ reserve and we can kind of fight back, right? It doesn't take so long. And then think of the elderly population. Um, I know with my grandparents, like if I had a cold, I wasn't allowed to see them because a cold that as a kid you just get over for the, it, once you're a bit older, it's harder to fight off. So that organ reserve diminishes as we age. So those little stressors that when we're young don't really affect us, they start to affect us a little bit more when we're older. And then they also add to um, less and less of this organ reserve. So the great thing is that skeletal muscle, so that's that uh, use it or lose it muscle. The muscle we either can gain or if you don't, uh, maybe you realize in the foundations, you, you can lose it if you don't <laughs> keep going. So um, what they have found is that muscle mass and organ reserve correlate through life. So basically, the more muscle mass that you have, the better organ reserve, or the more organ reserve you have. Does that kind of make sense? Um, so that's great. So that sort of, yeah, so you increase muscle mass, you increase your organ reserve, or you improve it at least, which is a really nice thing that we can do for ourselves. So this stat, I always kind of, kind of find mind-blowing. And it's a bit wordy, but 75% of our health and life expectancy after 40 is determined by our daily lifestyle choices. It's pretty crazy, right? So after 40, most of how you're going to age is determined by what you do. So as you guys know, diet's obviously a big part of that and you're already one step ahead. But we can be doing things like building muscle mass to age better and increase this organ reserve. And it's not too late. You can put muscle mass on at any age. Um, to go back to the lady who's around 70 in my classes, she just started coming a year ago and I wish someone else was here who knew her because it is crazy how much muscle she has put on. Not like she doesn't look um, that bulky or anything, but she is so much stronger and is going to age so much better than she would have two years ago before she started. Um, doing some exercise to build some muscle um, and she will be the first to say it. So it's not too late to um, start building muscle and it's really, really important to build some, to go into older age with muscle. Are there any questions about that? Makes sense? Yay muscles? Um, so what you can also do, so prevent inflammation which we know is avoiding that chronic cardio and also how we eat. So avoiding the grains, um, the sugar, things like that. Fish oil is a really great supplement. I'm not. I that's Dr. Murphy's field, and she's going to talk about it. But um, the fish oil is really great. I recommend not the one I was talking about. If anyone was here early and heard me saying it was spicy, <laughs> I'd have bought the wrong one. But most of them are okay. Um, get protein. We know we need protein to build muscles. Uh, limit exposure to toxins. So these are all things to keep your organ reserve up as well. So obviously the least the um, smaller exposure to to toxins, the, our organ reserve doesn't have to kind of work so hard, and then exercise appropriately. So try to avoid that, um, that chronic cardio. Okay, so use your resources. I, so our classes do go, um, they, are the, they go, they follow the Primal Blueprint Fitness. 
So if you're looking for a kind of summer, you don't have to go far. Our classes are for that, and hopefully with everyone signing up, we'll be able to get you in. Also, Mark Sissons uh, has a great ebook. It's called the Primal Blueprint Fitness ebook. So not that hard. Um, you just have to. I think you have to sign up for his email or something. Like you have to do something, and then you get it for free. You don't have to pay. So I'm pretty sure it's to sign up for his like monthly emails or something. Um, but it is a great book and it has all body weight exercises that you can do and progressions. So for the push up, for example, it would be um, on a wall. And then if you can do so many on a wall, you should do it on a, an incline. And if you do so many incline, you should do it from your knees. It's like that. Um, and then he has workouts based on what level you're on for different movements. And it's all body weight stuff. So if you can get to classes or if you need things in between classes, I really highly suggest his ebook. It's on his website, Mark's Daily Apple. There's also at-home workouts found on the Live Well Center blog. Um, my blog, I don't know if anyone's been to it, but I have a, a post on at-home workouts. I also have a muffin recipe. I was thinking that, but I didn't want to interrupt for pumpkin muffins. It's kind of a fall thing, but it, they're good. Um, and... That's it. So his blog, or sorry, his website and a couple of blogs have at-home stuff. And you really don't need weights or machines. Like, yes, we are lucky and have some weights in here that you guys can use, but if you don't need to and if you don't feel ready for weights, look at his at-home body weight stuff. As you guys know, if you're sore from squats, I don't even know if you're using weights, but squats are hard with just your body. Um, I'm very sore after just body weight squats. It's a great way to start too. To, if you haven't exercised in a while or you're um, or never, doing body weight stuff is a very safe approach to it because you're not you're just kind of dealing with your own body, not a weight that may drop or may um, injure you in some way. Okay, so we're on to the top one. So sprint. So all out efforts ranging sorry less than ten minutes every so once a week or once every 10 days so occasional series all at burst of effort which, which stimulate the production of the human growth hormone and testosterone which can have an immune boosting effect they also improve overall fitness target both muscle fiber types and delays the aging process this i find interesting which is too bad there's no or if you run so um Endurance running or that slow, that chronic cardio um, targets your slow muscle fibers. You remember how we have two muscle fiber types, so fast twitch and slow twitch? So when we do that long, slow run or type of exercise, we, in, we improve our slow twitch muscle fibers. But when we do sprinting or these, all, these bursts of energy, we actually target slow twitch and fast twitch. So for anyone who has training for a, a race of any kind, um, doing sprints, will not only make you better at your slow time throughout your race, but it will also, of course, at the end when you want to give it that one last go. Um, so it's almost like killing two birds with one stone. Obviously, you want to do a bit of slow running, but sprints are an amazing way to increase your, um, your slow running times, um, which I find neat. And so research shows that there are uh, better effects on weight loss than that medium-paced like, chronic cardio jog. Okay, we're almost done here with the list of things. So, um, what do sprints do? So, they increase muscle strength, power, and speed, increase bone density, um, muscle mass, insulin sensitivity, which we want, cardiovascular health, and aerobic capacity. So, that's coming from also doing the slow twitch muscle fibers as well. Um, stimulates the growth hormone, as I already said, and it consumes the storage fat in comparison to the aerobic, slow, or medium paced that stores fat. Um, and I just want to make a note that the sprinting is about the effort, not the speed. So I'm not talking about Olympic time trials here. Um, a burst of however fast you can go is what your body needs. It's all relative. Um, so, and it doesn't have to be with running. So it can be, um, if you're swimming, do one lap really quickly. If you're biking, try to do the next block as fast as you can. It's just an all-out burst. Um, it's short. This is the sh quickest workout that you'll ever do because you just it only takes a few seconds. Um, and it's really... Uh, oh, I guess it's not... 
Um, yeah, so it can be any exercise. It's quick and it's when you feel ready. I had a, a lady who did a couple challenges ago. Um, I reached, when I did this lecture, she put up her hand and said, I'm not ready, I can't do it. That's great, that's fine. And then it was like four months later, she emailed me. I, I hadn't heard from her and she was like, I sprinted today from one mailbox to the other. So I know right now there's a lot changing in your life with diet and the lifestyle, but one day you will feel ready to sprint. And when you do, please do. So if you're out for a walk with your dog and you, your dog's starting to kind of pull, and when you feel ready, run as fast as you can with them for a short amount of time. Um, it's a really nice feeling and it's really good for your body. And it can be for some people who are kind of doing everything right but not really losing weight. Um, that's the number one thing here we, we say. If everything else aligns, it's maybe it includes some sprinting into your body and we've had some, or into your routine and we've had some great results with that kind of last key piece that they're missing. So just make sure if you are doing a sprinting workout that you warm up. Um, so if you, you want to do it on your walk, make sure you've walked a little bit before you just take off um, and, and cool down as well. So just a good warm up before that. So as I just kind of said, just make sure that you listen to yourself over anything. So it's all great that I've said this and this is what we hope you do, but if you don't feel ready for exercise, please do not do it. Um, if you're tired or if one day, today was a perfect example, I, I signed up for a 7.15 class today and when my alarm went off this morning, I was like, mm-mm. I, I thought I was getting a cold and I slept and I woke up a couple hours later feeling great and with no cold or anything. Um, so when you feel like you just need to rest over exercise, please do. You will feel, when once your sugar kind of stabilizes a bit more, you will feel like you want to exercise. You'll just have so much energy you want not to do with it and then come see us. But um, so keep that in mind, like we want you to come to the classes, but don't feel obligated. If you signed up and um, you don't feel ready, yeah, please don't. Just do it when you feel ready. And, okay, so um, this was supposed to show how it's easy, but it looks really complicated, so I didn't, yeah. But basically, it was just supposed to show that um, in a normal week, there may be two days where you lift heavy things, so attend one of our classes on Tuesday and Thursday. Maybe on Saturday on your walk, you ran a mailbox to a mailbox, so you got your sprint in. And then all these other days of the week, these are options. So maybe on Sunday, you played with grandkids. But maybe on Friday you just rested, and maybe on Wednesday you just rested. Like there, there's options, and don't feel like it's a lot. So if I took this week and just rested on all these um, every other day, that actually isn't very much exercise, right? You're not getting in your slow moving, which you want, but um, I just don't want you to feel overwhelmed. So all we're really asking is that you move slow for as much as you can, and exercise in those workouts when you feel like it, and once in a while sprint. That kind of does it make sense that it's not it's not too overwhelming. Um, so what I hear often, or we hear often in the gym, is that I sit at a desk for eight hours a day, so that it's a write off. Um, there are little things throughout the day you can do um, if you unfortunately do have to sit for an extended amount of time. So a micro break is a great thing to do, and we're going to do it right now. So we printed them out, and for some reason they're extremely black, so you can't really see it. But um, basically, it's a short little tiny uh, mess the rest, um, thing. So what you do, and you're, we're all going to do it right now, if that's okay. And it's what you should do every 20 minutes at your desk. So if you can set an alarm or something to trigger it, um, it takes like, yeah, not very long at all. So what I want everyone to do is just, if you can, you may have to move your chair a little bit. I just want you to lean back in your chair, rotate your palms up to the ceiling, and hold for about 10 seconds in this stretch while sitting. Can you sit up? Um, you just sit in your chair and, and oh, lean you back. Oh. Yeah. So if, obviously at your desk you probably will have more room. But basically a micro break is leaning back, trying to squeeze your shoulder blades together, palms up for about 10 seconds. Bringing on any soreness from the workouts. And then you're going to stand up. Climb a fake ladder for 10. So like reach up as high as you can for 10 reaches. Then you're going to put your arms out to the side. Lift one palm up. Look at that palm and then you're going to rotate it down. Look, lift the other one and look at it. 
and you would do about 10 of this. After about 10, you would just sit back down. So super easy. Anyone you work here is going to wonder what you are doing, but um, it is just a quick way to get your shoulders, basically that sort of, we don't want you to be sitting like this, but that sort of rounded shoulders that a lot of us sit like, it's to get us moving the other way and get the shoulders and neck stretched out a little bit. So you can do that every 20 minutes, I hope you do. Get up and walk around as much as you can. So we, there aren't really smoke breaks anymore, right? Which is nice, or if people do smoke, they actually seem to get more breaks than if you don't. So we shouldn't be punished for not being smokers. So take coffee breaks if you can, or get up and get water as much as you possibly can. But try to use those breaks that at one point was kind of normal um, to get up and go for a smoke, to get up and just walk around. It's a lot healthier option. If you can, walk to lunch, do so. So luckily in Kingston, a lot of people work downtown. Um, so don't try not to drive the block to get to where you want to pick up your lunch. Um, walk, use your lunch break to walk as much as you can. Obviously, this kind of, I'm sure you've heard it before, but take the stairs. Um, yeah, the, ele the elevator could break down, you know, just take the, the safer, <laughs> the stairs, it's better for you. Um, park far away is a really good one. So, for example, at those call centers and places that, you know, you're sitting all day, but there's a huge parking lot, like, park far away. And that will give you the 10 minutes to work and back if you do have to drive. Um, Eat healthy, of course, throughout the workday will really help, but we're already doing that. And then take fish oil. The Get Rid of Your TV was an uh, article I read that was really good saying how, how bad basically TV is. I don't mean actually get rid of your TV, but think about what you do. If you do have to sit for eight hours a day, think about the couple hours you have after dinner and whether you spend them watching TV or kind of getting up. Get your Luckily, it's getting staying brighter. out. It's, it's still bright at 7.30, so um, that after dinner walk is a really great Thing other than you know watching TV as much as sometimes Don't we do. Don't you find that most people that work all day come home and they have to do laundry and dishes and cook a meal, and so they're a little busy for several hours after dinner. So they're not. They haven't got time to go and do the walks. I, th I do find that, but a lot of times when I ask, so in kind of the one-on-one -on -one consulting that I do, when they give reasons like that, and then I somehow slip in if they have TV shows they watch at a different time, and there's usually about one or two a night. So it's that kind of give and take if they do have time to watch an hour TV. I mean, everyone's different, and I'm, um, I can't I even imagine having kids. I'm busy enough without them. But if you can, just kind of those healthier choices um, when you can fit them in is what we're going for. But I am a big fan of once in a while TV. Does anyone watch Modern Family? That's my, that's my show. So, okay, so the microwave we just went over. So the handout, you can just even like pin up at work so it re um, reminds you every once in a while to do it. So I just want to take a quick minute and go over posture. So Ben and Sarah hopefully touched on everyone's posture a little bit. Did anyone walk in with perfect posture and not need anything? <laughs> no. no. Posture is really, really important. Um, again, it's kind of where I work that I, why I hear it so much, but the biggest concerns I see through the gym um, are low back pain, pain through the mid back, usually kind of where a bra strap would be, and um, pain or tension or where you hold your stress rate right up in, in your neck or um, shoulders. I hear that all the time, and a lot of it can actually be avoided. So obviously there's issues and, um, and problems that can't be, but sitting and standing properly is super... <laughs> Yeah, all um, is, a, is one of the best things you can do for your uh, your back health and your overall kind of um, those getting rid of those aches and pains. So I just wanted to go over it again to stress how important it is and usually it takes about one or two times to hear it before it kind of clicks. So I just want to kind of quickly, so these are the two, I am not, this isn't an attractive picture of me here, but um, these are the two postures we see most often. So. The first one is that really flat back. So you guys probably know now which one you are. Usually people fall into one or the other. So that flat back is like no bum, basically. So you could kind of put your hands all the way down your back um, without sort of hitting your, your hips on the way down. So a lot of low back pain can come from this 
posture. So when you're standing in this tucked under, which is what we usually call it position, how do you think I'm going to bend down and pick something up off the floor? Like this, right? I'm going to break right through my mid and low back and pick something heavy up. This usually comes from that one time picking something heavy up when the back gets thrown out, which is really unfortunate, right? Um, you also aren't recruiting enough of your pelvic floor, but we're not going to get into that too much. Um, and yeah, just a ton of low back pain comes from this. Upper body usually feels pretty good, but low back issues. The other posture I see often, I call it teenager posture, is this sort of, um, you do have that tailbone up, which they probably talked to you guys about. So you do want to have a bum, and they do, but then you kind of lean over it. Does this look familiar for anyone? I'm exaggerating. <laughs> but it's that rib cage too far back. So, and again, I'm sorry that you've heard this before, but we just want to really enforce it. So a lot of times, this is probably 80% of what I see, is this is our rib cage being a little bit too far back. And then, does anyone have that mother that told them to put their shoulders back constantly? Just mine. <laughs> I'll send her your way. But she, uh, so I always was told to put my shoulders back or stand up straight or whatever it may be, which I associated with putting shoulders back. So again, the big problem with this, which you've probably heard, is that if your rib cage is a little bit farther back than we want, then you shove your shoulders back. How do I look? Attractive. Thank you. <laughs> so not only do I look kind of funny, but I also, if you notice where my head is, it is alone out in front, right? We need our head forward. We have to see where we're going, and most of us have phones we need to be on at all times. Um, so we need our head forward, but we need something to support it. So when we're standing like this, our neck and upper back are working in like overdrive to hold their head up. If they weren't working, I would look like this. So a lot of times this um, forward head but back rib cage stem from that holding your tension through here. So if you do feel like you hold your tension in your shoulders or have that kind of chronic um, neck and back pain, a lot of headaches stem from poor posture too because um, just so your muscles are just so tired and overworked that it, it radiates up through the head. But um, basically, we do not want this. If you can avoid it at all costs, please do. So um, the key is you guys want to stand up maybe and just work on your posture quickly. Again, every 20 minutes you want to be standing. So um, basically, just remember those cues they probably told you that you want to imagine there's a string on your tailbone and someone's pulled up. I'll show you a good posture here. So someone's pulled up. So you, at the small of your back, you can feel a spot for your hands, kind of where your pants would begin. And then to fix your rib cage, you want to imagine a string is on your chest and someone's pulled forward. So if you can see me, I'm going from here to bringing my rib cage forward. So my head ha actually hasn't moved, but because my chest is underneath it, my neck doesn't have to work quite as hard to hold it up. Does that make sense? So cues that you're standing correctly, if everyone's been giving it a try, you've probably felt that shift in weight. So the balls of your feet should take more of our weight than our heels, um, or that feeling like you can lift your heels up if you want, or easily. Again, the smaller your back, there should be a spot for your hand. And if you can have someone at home or wherever um, check for you, you want your ears to be over your shoulders. I don't know if you tried to do it in the gym, but when you turn, they always look like that. Um, so it unfortunately takes someone else to look, but that's a really good cue that our head isn't dropped in front. Um, another thing you want to want to notice is that you don't feel right through like where your bra strap is that you're rounding. So your mid back should be actually quite flat. If you imagine a skeleton, they're sort of like that, right? Flat, and then you have your your lumbar curve. Has everyone been working on it a little bit? Trying posture? It's hard, isn't it? to change how you've been standing for years. Um, I can't stress enough with exercise, you can't end up in good posture if you don't start in it. So if we're throwing weights on you and um, we want to do it safely, we can't guarantee that you're going to end up in a safe position if you start in poor posture, right? Um, did you notice in the kettlebell swings, for everyone who's been here, it's that like you keep the motion of your, or the alignment of your spine the whole way. So if you're starting in bad posture, your kettlebell swing is not going to be safe and then we won't 
you won't be able to do it in the classes. Um, okay, so I'm not sure if they had the chance to go over sitting posture very much. Do you guys know if you did at all? Depending on the person, how okay. much they sat. Right. So um, the big thing is that most of my clients really give it an honest try, I, I think, in the mornings, but then they sit for eight hours a day, and it's like one step forward, ten backwards, right? So I'm just going to use my, my face, this chair. Thank you. And luckily here we have like the worst chairs, so if you can sit properly here, you can do it anywhere. So um, all those key points that I said about standing posture usually are the exact opposite of how we sit. Even if we try to sit well, as we get kind of bored or distracted with work, we usually end up pushing out through our lower back, our mid-back being quite rounded, and then again we have to see our work or our computer screen, so our head has to be forward, but nothing's supporting it, nothing's underneath it. So the best advice I have for you is to roll something up. Um, I, in the picture, I'm using a bed sheet, which works nicely. Um, a yoga mat works well. I found that it's a bit more normal for people to carry around a yoga mat than it is a bed sheet. So I think I'm having better luck with that. But basically, if you roll something up, and this is just to get practice. So once you feel comfortable with sitting, you don't have to. But this is just for the first couple of weeks of getting comfortable, but if you roll something up and sit up on it, my, and you may have to do two or you have to do this in a sheet, you'll have to work out what feels comfortable for you, but if you do this, it's almost like that analogy of the string on your tailbone. It's like someone's lifted my hips up a little bit. So it puts my pelvis in the right position. I have the small of my back um, has that nice curve in it. And then my head hasn't actually moved position. Like, I, it's not any far for, for further or back, but it's just supported. Do you see that in this posture? And it's actually really comfortable to sit in. Uh, like, we do it all the time, and I have great feedback from clients that are sitting on something. So there's like a couple here if you want to give it a try, but basically with sitting, it's the exact same posture. So if you have nothing else, if you don't have a yoga mat and you're sitting somewhere, at least think about shoving your bum as far back as you can and sitting on so that the weight is distributed across your legs. So do you ever notice like in that first picture of me, all of my weight is way up on my, basically on my SI joints. If anyone has SI joint pain, this is really important for you. Um, but my weight's way up. It's not even on my bum almost, it's on my hips. So if you have nothing else, at least try to get weight spread throughout the legs as well. Um, that's kind of what they're there for when we're sitting, okay? And then usually if you just like shove your bum back as far as you can, it'll create this arch. This just takes a little more thought to not slouch after a couple minutes. Um, but I, re I highly recommend the yoga mat. Once you get more comfortable with standing posture and sitting, you won't need it because your body just won't want you to be um, kind of slumped. But it really is a good trick for the first little while. Uh, a lot of people ask about those lumbar support cushions. I think like some offices supply them. They're great for lumbar curve, but my kind of problem with them, this isn't really going to fit, but imagine it was there. The problem is people just slouch over them. So yes, it keeps your lumbar curve, but you're not really helping your head situation because your ribcage is still a little bit too farther back. So if you have one, just sit on it. You can still use it, but use it in a different <laughs> spot. Um, yeah, and avoid, have you guys ever noticed those new car seats? What is with those? They like angle at the back of your head. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a certain, yeah, I don't know if it's a certain kind of car, but I just noticed recently that those car seats, I'm not quite sure. It's like they're, they've been installed the wrong way or something. But Okay, anything with posture, really important. Um, special, so as much as you can in your workday, stand up, but if you do have to sit, please try to sit properly. It can do wonders for your back and save all those little aches and pains that come from sitting and a lot of SI and uh, low back pain if you're sitting in that tucked under position. Okay, so we're going to go over some body composition results.